Q1. What are the crimes under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court? The following are the crimes cognizable by the International Criminal Court. 1. The crime of genocide. B. Crimes against humanity. C. War crimes. D. The crime of aggression. Q2. What is genocide? For the purpose of this statute, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethical, racial, or religious group as such. A. Killing members of the group. B. Causing serious bodily or mentally harm to members of the group. C. Deliberately inflicting under group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. D. Imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. And E. Forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Q3. What is crimes against humanity? Crime against humanity means any of the following acts enumerated in Article 7 of the Rome Statute when committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against any civilian population with knowledge of the attack. Q4. What are the conditions before the ICC can exercise jurisdiction over the crimes under the jurisdiction of the ICC? Before the ICC can exercise jurisdiction, it is required that the state must be a state party to the convention. It is provided under the Rome Statute that the state parties considered deemed to have accepted the jurisdiction of the ICC. Article 12. ICC shall also have jurisdiction over those cases referred to it by the Security Council under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. Q5. Can the ICC acquire jurisdiction over nationals of non-parties? Yes, the ICC may exercise jurisdiction even over nationals of states that are not parties to the treaty and have not otherwise consented to the jurisdiction. Article 12 provides that in addition to jurisdiction based on Security Council, action under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, and jurisdiction based on consent by the defendant state nationality, the ICC will have jurisdiction to prosecute the nationals of any state when crimes within the court's subject matter jurisdiction are committed on the territory of the state party. Likewise, ICC will have jurisdiction over a non-state party if it consented to ICC jurisdiction. Q6. What is the principle of complementarity? The principle of complementarity means that the court will only prosecute an individual if states are unwilling or unable to prosecute. Therefore, if legitimate national investigations or proceedings into crimes have taken place or are ongoing, the court will not initiate proceedings. This principle applies regardless of the outcome of the national proceedings. Even if an investigation is closed without any criminal charges being filed, or if an accused person is acquitted by a national court, the court will not prosecute an individual for the crime in question so long as it is satisfied that the national proceedings were legitimate. Q7. What is the effect of belligerent occupation? Political laws, except the laws in treason, are suspended. Municipal laws remain in force unless changed by the belligerent occupant. At the end of the belligerent occupation, the political laws, which had been suspended, shall automatically become effective again under the doctrine of just post liminium. Ko Kim Chan vs. Valdez, 75 Phil, 113. Q8. What is the effect of change of sovereignty? The political laws of the former sovereign are not only suspended, but abrogated. As they regulate the relations between the ruler and the ruled, these laws fall to the ground ipso facto, unless they are retained or reenacted by positive act of the new sovereign. But municipal laws remain in force. Q9. Who may propose changes to the constitution? 
The following may propose changes to the Constitution. 1. The Congress, upon a vote of three-fourths of its members, Section 1, Number 1, Article 17. Number 2. A Constitutional Convention, Section 1, Number 2, Article 17. Number 3. People, through initiative, upon a petition of at least 12 percentum of the total number of registered voters, of which every legislative district must be represented by at least 3 percentum of the registered voters therein. Section 2, Article 17. Q10. What are the two ways by which the Constitution may be changed? Amendments and revision. Q11. Differentiate revision from amendment. Revision broadly implies a change that alters a basic principle in the Constitution. There is also revision if the change alters the substantial entirety of the Constitution. Amendment broadly refers to a change that adds, reduces, or deletes without altering the basic principle involved. Revision generally affects several provisions of the Constitution, while amendment generally affects only the specific provision being amended. Lambina v. Komalik, October 25, 2006. Q12. What are the two tasks to determine the kind of change that is proposed? Quantitative task. It inquires into the number of provision altered, deleted, or changed. Quantitative task. It inquires into the qualitative effect of proposed change. Q13. May people's initiative be used to revise the Constitution? No. People's initiative cannot be used to revise the Constitution. The rationale for the answer lies in the Constitutional text. Section 1, Article 17 provides that amendment or revision may be proposed by Congress and Constitutional Convention, while Section 2 provides that amendment may likewise be proposed by the people. Q14. Is the definition of national territory under our Constitution internationally binding? No. The definition of the Philippine territory under the 1987 Constitution is not binding internationally. It should be noted that a Constitution is a municipal law. Being such, it only binds the nation promulgating it. Thus, for it to be binding internationally, the extent of national territory under the 1987 Constitution must be supported by proofs which are acceptable under international law. Q15. What is archipelagic doctrine? Archipelagic doctrine prescribes a principle that archipelago should be considered one integrated unit instead of being divided into several islands. This can be affected by connecting the outermost points of the outermost islands of the archipelago with a straight baseline and all the waters inside the baseline shall be considered internal waters. Q16. Is archipelagic doctrine reflected in the definition of territory under Article 1? Yes. Article 1 reflects the archipelagic doctrine. The last sentence of Article 1 provides that the waters around, between, and connecting the islands of the archipelago regardless of their breadth and dimensions, form part of the internal waters of the Philippines. Q17. Is archipelagic doctrine binding under international law? No. Archipelagic doctrine is not yet accepted under international law. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UN Clause 3, does not treat the waters inside the baseline as internal waters. UN Clause 3 treats them as archipelagic waters. Q18. What is the difference between internal water and archipelagic water? When a water is considered internal, it is subject to the plenary jurisdiction of the state over which it has sovereignty and jurisdiction. Such state can disallow the passage of foreign vessels. Such vessels may only be allowed passage upon the consent of the controlling state. Archipelagic water are those waters inside the archipelagic baselines drawn joining the outermost points of the outermost island of the archipelago. Under UN Clause 3, the archipelagic state has sovereignty over archipelagic water. 
the sovereignty extends to airspace as well as to its seabed and subsoil and resources contained therein. However, unlike internal water, archipelagic water is subject to the right of innocent passage, which right is provided by Article 52 of the UN Clause 3. Q19. Petitioners question the constitutionality of RA 9522 as it reduces Philippine maritime territory. And logically, the reach of the Philippine state's sovereign power in violation of Article 1 of the 1987 Constitution, embodying the terms of the Treaty of Paris and ancillary treaties, is the law constitutional. The law is constitutional. Baselines laws are nothing but statutory mechanisms for UN Clause 3, states, parties to delimit with precision the extent of their maritime zones and continental shelves. In turn, this gives notice to the rest of the international community of the scope of the maritime space and submarine areas within which states' parties exercise treaty-based rights, namely, the exercise of sovereignty over territorial waters, Article 2 UN Clause 3, the jurisdiction to enforce customs, fiscal, immigration, and sanitation laws in the contiguous zone, Article 33 UN Clause 3 and the right to exploit the living and non-living resources in the exclusive economic zone, Article 56, UN Clause 3, and Continental Shelf, Article 77. Magalona versus Ermita. Q20. Is the adaptation of RA 9522's adaptation of UN Clause regime of islands to determine maritime zones of Kalayan Group of Island and Scarborough Shoal inconsistent with Philippine claim of sovereignty over these areas? thus violating Article 1 of the Constitution? The baseline law by adopting UN Clause regime of islands does not dismember Kalayan Group of Islands and Scarborough Shoal from the national territory. The Philippine sovereignty and jurisdiction were not diminished by the baseline law. Under UN Clause, archipelagic state has the right to draw baselines, but the drawing of such baselines shall not depart to any appreciable extent from the general configuration of the archipelago. Article 47.3 of the UN Clause. Kalayan Group of Islands are located at the appreciable distance from the nearest shoreline of the Philippines archipelago, Magalona versus Ermita. Q21. What are the maritime zones? Territorial sea. It is a sea, the breadth of which does not exceed 12 nautical miles from the baseline, Article 3. Contiguous zone, it is a sea, the breadth of which does not exceed 24 nautical miles from the baseline, Article 33, Number 2. Exclusive economic zone, it is a sea, the breadth of which does not exceed 200 nautical miles from the baseline, Article 54. Continental shelf, the continental shelf of a coastal state comprises the seabed and subsoil of the submarine areas that extend beyond its territorial sea throughout the natural prolongation of its land territory to the outer edge of the continental margin or to a distance of 200 nautical miles from the baselines from which the breadth of the territorial sea is measured where the outer edge of the continental margin does not extend up to that distance. Article 76. Q22. What are the rights of a coastal state over maritime zones? The coastal state has sovereignty over the territorial sea subject to the Convention and to other rules of international law, Article 2 UN Clause 3. Contiguous zone. The coastal state has the right to exercise control necessary to 1. Prevent infringement of its customs, fiscal, immigration, or sanitary laws and regulations within its territory or territorial sea, and two, punish infringement of the above laws and regulations committed within its territory or territorial sea, Article 33. Exclusive Economic Zone. The coastal state has the sovereign right for the purpose of exploring and exploiting, conserving and managing the natural resources. It has also jurisdiction over the establishment and use of artificial islands, installations, and structures marine scientific research, and the protection and preservation of the marine environment, Article 56, UN Clause.
The coastal state has the exclusive right to explore and exploit its natural resources therein. Article 77. Q23. What is the constitutional basis of principle of separation of powers? The constitutional basis of the principle of separation of powers is the allocation of powers by the Constitution to the three great departments of the government and constitutional commission. Thus, these three departments must discharge their respective functions within the limits of authority conferred by the Constitution. Philippine Coconut Producers Federation versus Republic, GR numbers 1778-57-58. Q24. When is there violation of principle of separation of powers? The principle of separation of powers may be violated in two ways. Firstly, one branch may interfere impermissibly with the other's performance of its constitutionally assigned function, and alternatively, the doctrine may be violated when one branch assumes a function that is more properly entrusted to another. In other words, there is a violation of the principle when there is impermissible interference with an or b assumption of another department's functions. Belgica versus Ochoa GR two zero eight five six six. Q25. Section 12 of Attrition Law provides Joint Congressional Oversight Committee. There is hereby created a Joint Congressional Oversight Committee composed of seven members from the Senate and seven members from the House of Representatives. The members from the Senate shall be appointed by the Senate President, with at least two senators representing the minority. The members from the House of Representatives shall be appointed by the Speaker, with at least two members representing the minority. After the Oversight Committee will have approved the implementing rules and regulations, it shall thereafter become functus officio and therefore cease to exist. Is it constitutional? No. From the moment the law becomes effective, any provision of law that empowers Congress or any of its members to play any role in the implementation of enforcement of the law violates the principle of separation of powers and is thus unconstitutional. Under this principle, a provision that requires Congress or its members to approve the implementing rules of a law after it has already taken effect shall be unconstitutional, as is a provision that allows Congress or its members to overturn any directive or ruling made by the members of the executive branch charged with the implementation of the law. Abacada v. Purissima. Q26. What is legislative veto? Legislative veto is a statutory provision requiring the president or an administrative agency to present the proposed implementing rules and regulations of a law to Congress, which by itself or through a committee formed by it retains a right or power to approve or disapprove such regulations before they take effect. Abacada Guru Party List v. Purissima Q27 Is legislative veto constitutional? No. Legislative veto is unconstitutional. Legislative veto violates the principle of separation of powers. From the moment the law becomes effective, any provision of law that empowers Congress or any of its members to play any role in the implementation or enforcement of the law violates the principle of separation of powers and is thus unconstitutional. Q28. What is a pork barrel system? Pork barrel system as the collective body of rules and practices that govern the manner by which lump sum discretionary funds primarily intended for local projects are utilized through the respective participation of the legislative and executive branches of government, including its members. Q29. What is Congressional Pork Barrel System? It is defined as the kind of lump sum discretionary fund wherein legislators, either individually or collectively organized into committees, are able to effectively control certain aspects of the fund's utilization through various post-enactment measures and or practices. Q30. Does pork barrel system violate the principle of separation of powers? Yes. The pork barrel system violates the principle of separation of powers. The distinguishing factor of a pork barrel system, specifically congressional pork barrel, 
is the authority of the legislator to participate in the post-enactment phases of project implementation. These post-enactment measures, which govern the areas of project identification, fund release and fund realignment, are not related to functions of congressional oversight and hence allow legislators to intervene and or assume duties that properly belong to the sphere of budget execution. Belgica versus Executive Secretary, November 19, 2013. Q31. Supposing Congressman Manika of the 1st District of Oriental Mindoro, during the budget deliberation in Congress, allocated a total of 70 million worth of projects in his district. All congressmen followed suit. Each of them allocated 70 million worth of projects to their respective districts. Because senators would not want to be left out, each of them identified projects worth 200 million. They were approved and they were all carried out in the GAA, which was eventually passed and approved. Are the actions of the legislators as reflected in the GAA constitutional? The action of the legislators as reflected in the GAA is not unconstitutional. What is prohibited under the Constitution is the participation of the legislators in the post-enactment phases of project implementation. This is prescribed because it violates the constitutional principle of separation of powers. However, when project identification is done during congressional budget deliberation, the same will not violate separation of powers. The project identification happened while Congress is performing its very function, which is legislation. Q32. How does DAP or Disbursement Acceleration Program violate separation of powers? The act of the president of allotting or redirecting funds for certain programs, activities, or projects well beyond to what Congress had intended, arrogate unto himself a power that belongs to Congress. While the president is authorized to spend in line with his mandate to execute the laws, including the GAAs, such authority shall not translate to unfettered discretion that allows him to substitute his own will for that of Congress. Arnolo v. Aquino III, 728 Scrap 1, Q33. What is the basis of non-delegation of power? It is based upon the ethical principle that such delegated power constitutes not only a right but a duty to be performed by the delegate through the instrumentality of his own judgment and not through the intervening mind of another. U.S. v. Bar Yes, 11 Field, 327. A further delegation of such power unless permitted by the sovereign power would constitute a negation of this duty in violation of the trust reposed in the delegate mandated to discharge it directly. Cruz and Cruz Philippines Political Law. Q34, Section 17, Article 12 provides that in times of national emergency, when the public interest so requires, the state may during the emergency and on the reasonable terms prescribed by it, temporarily take over or direct the operation of any privately owned public utility or business affected with public interest. Can this provision be legally invoked by the president to temporarily take over or direct the operation of any privately owned public utility or business affected with public interest during without authority from Congress? No. Without legislation, the president has not power to take over privately owned public utility of business affected with public interest. In short, the president has no absolute authority to exercise all the power of the state under Section 17, Article 12 in the absence of an Emergency Powers Act passed by Congress. David v. Arroyo, 489, Scrap 161. Q35. What are the tests for valid delegation? Completeness tests. The law must be complete in all its essential terms when it leaves the legislature so that there will be nothing left for the delegate to do when it reaches him except to enforce it. A law is complete when it sets forth during the policy to be executed 
carried out or implemented by the delegate. Pelais versus Auditor General 122 Phil 965. Sufficient Standard Test. A sufficient standard test is intended to map out the boundaries of the delegate's authority by defining the legislative policy and indicating the circumstances under which it is to be pursued. The purpose of sufficient standard is to prevent a total transference of legislative power from law-making body to the delegate, who is not allowed to step into the shoes of the legislature and exercise a power essentially legislative. Eastern Shipping Lines versus POEA. Q36. Section 8 of PD 910, Law Governing the Disposition of Malampaya Funds, pertinently provides all fees, revenues, and receipts of the board shall form part of a special fund to be used to finance energy resource development and exploitation programs and projects of the government and for such other purposes as may be hereafter directed by the president. Is this provision valid? The provision is invalid as it constitutes an undue delegation of legislative power. The phrase, and for such other purposes as may be hereafter directed by the President, under Section 8 of PD 910, constitutes an undue delegation of legislative power insofar it is does not lay down a sufficient standard to adequately determine the limits of the President's authority with respect to the purpose of which the Malampaya funds may be used. Belgica versus Executive Secretary. Q37. Congress passed a law which provides that all candidates for elective public office should undergo mandatory drug testing. Law provides that those who will not undergo drug testing, they will be allowed to assume the function of the office for which they were elected, even if they were proclaimed. Is the law valid? The law is not valid as it adds the constitutional qualification for senator which is fixed by the Constitution, Social Justice Society versus DDB. Q38. What are the constitutional requirements for the apportionment of legislative district? 1. Legislative districts apportioned among the provinces, cities, and the metropolitan Manila area in accordance with the number of their respective inhabitants and on the basis of a uniform and progressive ratio Section 5, number 1 of Article 6. 2. Each legislative district shall comprise, as far as practicable, contiguous, compact, and adjacent territory. Section 5, number 2 of Article 6. 3. Each city with a population of at least 250,000 or each province shall have at least one representative. Section 5, number 3, Article 6. Q39. Is plebiscite needed for the effectivity of the creation of a district representative? Plebiscite is only needed in the creation of local government units. Legislative district is not a local government unit. Therefore, plebiscite is not required for the effectivity of the creation of legislative district. Bagabuyo v. Comelec. Q40. Does the 250 thousand population requirement apply to the creation of legislative district in provinces? No. It applies only in cities. Aquino, the third versus Comelec. Q41. In the ARMM law, the regional assembly of ARMM is allowed to create a province within ARMM. Is the law constitutional? No. Under the constitution, its province shall have at least one representative. Thus, the creation of a province carries with it a creation of legislative district, and only Congress can create a legislative district. Therefore, only Congress can create a province. Sema versus Kamalek. Q42. Who may participate in party list election? The following may participate in party list election. 1. National parties and organizations. 2. Regional parties or organizations. 3. Sectoral parties and organizations. Eidom Paglawam versus Comelec, April 2, 2013. Q43. 
Is it required that parties or organization be organized along sectorial lines or be marginalized and underrepresented? National parties or organizations and regional parties or organizations do not need to organize along sectorial lines and do not need to represent any marginalized and underrepresented sector. Adam Pagluam versus Comelec. Q44, may a political party participate in partyless election? Political parties can participate in partyless elections provided they register under the partyless system and do not field candidates in legislative district election. Atong Paglawam v. Comelec, April 2, 2013. Q45. What are the parameters of the partyless system? 1. Three different groups may participate in the partyless system. 1. National parties or organizations. 2. Region parties or organizations. and 3. Sectoral parties or organizations. Number 2. National parties or organizations and regional parties or organizations do not need to organize along sectoral lines and do not need to represent any marginalized and underrepresented sector. 3. Political parties can participate in partyless elections provided they register under the partyless system and do not field candidates in legislative district elections. A political party, whether major or not, that fields candidates in legislative district elections can participate in partyless elections only through its sectoral wing that can separately register under the partyless system. The sectoral wing is by itself an independent sectoral party and is linked to a political party through a coalition. Number four, sectoral parties or organizations may either be marginalized or underrepresented or lacking in well defined political constituencies. It is enough that their principal advocacy pertains to the special interests and concerns of their sector. The sectors that are marginalized and underrepresented include labor, peasant, fisher folk, urban poor, indigenous cultural communities, handicapped, veterans, and overseas workers. The sectors that lack well-defined political constituencies include professionals, the elderly, women, and the youth. 5. A majority of the members of sectoral parties or organizations that represent the marginalized and underrepresented must belong to the marginalized and underrepresented sector they represent. Similarly, a majority of the members of sectoral parties or organizations that lack well-defined political constituencies must belong to the sector they represent. The nominees of sectoral parties or organizations that represent the marginalized and underrepresented or that represent those who lack well-defined political constituencies either must belong to their respective sectors or must have a track record of advocacy for their respective sectors. The nominees of national and regional parties or organizations must be bona fide members of such parties or organizations. And six, national, regional, and sectoral parties or organizations shall not be disqualified if some of their nominees are disqualified, provided that they have at least one nominee who remains qualified. Hatong Paglawam versus Comelec. Q46. Can the Supreme Court interfere with the election of minority floor leader in the House of Representatives? No. In the case of Defensor Santiago v. Gingona, which involved a dispute on the rightful Senate minority leader during the 11th Congress, 1998-2001, to this court observed that, while the Constitution is explicit on the manner of electing a Speaker of the House of Representatives, it is, however, dead silent on the manner of selecting the other officers of the lower house. All that the Charter says is that, each house shall choose each other officers as it may deem necessary. As such, the method of choosing who will be such other officers is merely a derivative of the exercise of the prerogative conferred by the aforecoded constitutional provision. Therefore, such method must be prescribed by the House of Representatives itself, not by the court. Hence, as a general rule, 
This court has no authority to interfere and unilaterally intrude into that exclusive realm without running afoul of constitutional principles that it is bound to protect and uphold. Constitutional respect and a becoming regard for the sovereign acts of a co-equal branch prevents the court from prying into the internal workings of the House of Representatives. Bagillet Jr. v. Alvarez, Q47. Congressman Abaya, the chair of the Committee on Transportation in the 16th Congress, authored bill creating a Department of Transportation, DOTR. The bill was approved and eventually signed by the president into law. May Congressman Abaya be appointed as cabinet secretary of the newly created DOTR? No. Congressman Abaya cannot be appointed as secretary of DOTR. The last sentence of Section 13, Article 6, provides that no member of Congress may be appointed to any office which may have been created or the emoluments thereof increased during the term for which he was elected. Q48. What is the jurisdiction of electoral tribunal? The sole judge of all contests relating to the election, returns, and qualifications of the members of the Senate and the House of Representatives. Section 17, Article 6. Q49. When does the jurisdiction of the Comelec over the candidates for House end? And when does the jurisdiction of the Electoral Tribunal begin? The jurisdiction of an Electoral Tribunal begins when a winning candidate has been 1. Proclaimed. 2. Taken his oath. 3. Assumed office. Q50. May Comelec entertain petition for Disqualification of candidate for representative, senator, and president? No. There is absence of an authorized proceeding for determining before election the qualifications of candidate for representative, senator, and president. To disqualify a candidate, there must be a declaration by a final judgment of a competent court that the candidate sought to be disqualified is guilty of or found by the Commission to be suffering from any disqualification provided by law or the Constitution. Paul v. Comelec Q51 Congress provided that a law it had passed may be re-amended or revised by the Congress of the Philippines upon the vote of two-thirds of the members of the House of Representatives and the Senate. Is the law valid? No. The Supreme Court declared this unconstitutional, for Congress cannot pass an irrepealable laws. Supreme Court said where the legislature by its own act attempts to limit its power to amend or repeal laws, the court has the duty to strike down such act for interfering with the plenary powers of Congress. Abasquita v. Senate Q52. How does a bill become a law? When the president signs it. When the president vetoes it, but the veto was overridden by two-thirds of all the members of the House. When the president does not act upon it within 30 days after it shall have been presented to him. Q53. May the president approve some part or parts of the bill and veto the rest? As a general rule, if the president disapproves a bill approved by Congress, he should veto the entire bill. He is not allowed to veto separate items of a bill. It is only in the case of appropriation, revenue, and tariff bills that he is authorized to exercise item veto. Q54. What is an appropriation law? An appropriation measure may be defined as a statute, the primary and specific purpose of which it is to authorize the release of public funds from the Treasury. A law creating an office and providing funds, therefore, is not an appropriation law, since the main purpose is not to appropriate funds, but to create the office. Q55. What are the constitutional limitations on the power of appropriation? Section 24, Article 6. All appropriation, revenue, or tariff bills, bills authorizing increase of the public debt, bills of local application, and private bills, shall originate exclusively in the House of Representatives, but the Senate may propose or concur with amendments. Section 25, Number 1, Article 6. The Congress may not increase the appropriations recommended by the President for the operation of the government as specified in the budget, 
the form, content, and manner of preparation of the budget shall be prescribed by law. Section 25, number 2. No provision or enactment shall be embraced in the General Appropriations Bill unless it relates specifically to some particular appropriation therein. Any such provision or enactment shall be limited in its operation to the appropriation to which it relates. Section 25, number 3. The procedure in approving appropriations for the Congress shall strictly follow the procedure for approving appropriations for other departments and agencies. Section 25, number 4. A special appropriations bill shall specify the purpose for which it is intended and shall be supported by funds actually available as certified by the National Treasurer or to be raised by corresponding revenue proposal therein. Section 25, number 6. Discretionary funds appropriated for particular officials shall be dispersed only for public purposes to be supported by appropriate vouchers and subject to such guidelines as may be prescribed by law. And Section 29, number 2. No public money or property shall be appropriated, applied, paid, or employed, directly or indirectly, for the use, benefit, or support of any sect, church, denomination, sectarian institution, or system of religion, or any priest, preacher, minister, other religious teacher, or dignitary as such, except when such priest, preacher, minister, or dignitary is assigned to the armed forces or to any penal institution or government orphanage or leprosarium. Q56. What is Disbursement Allocation Program? DAP is a program by which the president accumulates or gathers the supposed savings from the offices under the office of the president to create a pool of funds. This pool of funds will be a source of funds for the priority projects of the government. This is intended to accelerate governmental spending. The source of funds is the supposed savings, which were derived from unreleased appropriations and unobligated allotment. Raulo versus Aquino. Q57. What are considered savings under the law? The following are considered savings under the law. 1. Funds which are still available after the completion or final discontinuance or abandonment of the work, activity, or purpose for which the appropriation is authorized. 2. There can be savings when there is unpaid compensation and related costs pertaining to vacant positions. 3. There can be savings from cost cutting measures adopted by the government agencies. Q58. Are unreleased appropriations and unobligated allotment savings under the law? No. Based on the above conception of savings. Q59. What are considered unconstitutional in the case of Arolo versus Aquino? The following are considered unconstitutional the pooling of funds from unreleased appropriations and withdrawn unobligated allotments being not savings violates section 25 number 5 of article 6 number 2 the transfer of funds from dap to augment deficient items not provided in the gaa violates section 29 number 1 of article 6 number 3 cross border augmentations from savings were violative of Section 25, Number 5 of Article 6. Q60. What are the requisites for a valid transfer of appropriated funds under Section 25, Number 5, Article 6 of the 1987 Constitution? There is a law authorizing the transfer funds within their respective offices. Number 2. The funds to be transferred were savings generated from the appropriations for their respective offices, and three, the purpose of the transfer is to augment an item in the general appropriations law for their respective offices. Q61. What is the difference between the power of Congress under Section 22, question hour, and its power to conduct legislative investigation? Section 21. It relates to the power to conduct inquiries in aid of legislation, the aims to which is to elicit information that may be used for legislation, 
In the exercise of its power under Section 21, Congress can compel the appearance of cabinet secretaries. Section 22 pertains to the power to conduct question hour to obtain information in pursuit of Congress oversight function. In the exercise of its power under Section 22, Congress can only request the appearance of the secretaries of the Executive Department, Sene versus Ermita. Q62. The President issued OE 464, directing certain officials of the government to secure prior consent from the President before they appear before in Congress. Is the EO constitutional? EO is unconstitutional. It violates Section 21, Article 6, when Congress exercises power of inquiry in aid of legislation. Heads of department cannot refuse appearance during the inquiry on the claim that they have not secured prior president's consent. They can only refuse appearance on a valid claim of executive privilege. They are not exempt by the mere fact that they are department heads. When Congress exercises its power of inquiry, the only way for department heads to exempt themselves therefrom is by a valid claim of privilege. They are not exempt by the mere fact that they are department heads. Only one executive official may be exempted from this power, the president, on whom executive power is vested, hence beyond the reach of Congress except through the power of impeachment. Senate versus Ermita. Q63. Can Congress compel the justices of the Supreme Court to appear during congressional inquiry? No. By the same token, members of the Supreme Court are also exempt from this power of inquiry. Unlike the presidency, judicial power is vested in a collegial body. Hence, each member thereof is exempt on the basis not only of separation of powers, but also on the fiscal autonomy and the constitutional independence of the judiciary. Q64. What are the requisites of presidential communication privilege? First, communications must relate to quintessential and non-delegable power of the president. Second, the communications are received by the president's close advisors. Third, there is no adequate showing of compelling need that would justify the limitation of the privilege and of the unavailability of the information elsewhere. Q65. For how long can the Congress detain a person cited for legislative contempt? The court finds that the period of imprisonment under the inherent power of contempt by the Senate during inquiries in aid of legislation should only last until the termination of the legislative inquiry under which the said power is invoked. In the case of Arnold, it was stated that obedience to its process may be enforced by the Senate committee if the subject of investigation before it was within the range of legitimate legislative inquiry and the proposed testimony called relates to that subject. Accordingly, as long as there is a legitimate legislative inquiry, then the inherent power of contempt by the Senate may be properly exercised. Conversely, once the said legislative inquiry concludes, the exercise of the inherent power of contempt ceases and there is no more genuine Necessity to penalize the detained witness. Balak v. Senate, GR 234-608, 2018. Q66. When is legislative inquiry deemed terminated? Section 22, Report of Committee. Within 15 days after the conclusion of the inquiry, the committee shall meet to begin the consideration of its report. The report shall be approved by a majority vote of all its members. Concurring and dissenting reports may likewise be made by the members who do not sign the majority report within 72 hours from the approval of the report. The number of members who sign reports concurring in the conclusions of the committee report shall be taken into account in determining whether the report has been approved by a majority of the members. The legislative inquiry of the Senate also terminates upon the expiration of one Congress. As stated in NERI, all pending matters and proceedings such as unpassed bills and even legislative investigations of the Senate are considered terminated upon the expiration of that Congress, and it is merely optional on the Senate of the succeeding Congress to take up such unfinished matters not in the same status but as if 
presented for the first time. Balak versus Senate. Q67, the law allows the holder of appointive position in the executive department to hold any other office other than he is presently holding. Is the law constitutional? It is unconstitutional insofar as the president, department head, deputies, and assistants are concerned. All other appointive officials in the civil service are allowed to hold other office or employment in the government during their tenure when such is allowed by law or by the primary functions of their positions. However, members of the cabinet, their deputies and assistants may do so only when expressly authorized by the Constitution itself. In other words, Section 7, Article 1, XB is meant to lay down the general rule applicable to all elective and appointed public officials and employees, while Section 13, Article 7 is meant to be the exception applicable only to the president, the vice president, members of the cabinet, their deputies and assistants. Civil Liberties Union versus Executive Secretary. Q68. Two months immediately preceding the day of election, the president appointed a justice of the Supreme Court. Does the appointment violate Section 15, Article 7 of the Constitution? No. Prohibition under Section 15, Article 7 does not apply to appointments to fill a vacancy in the Supreme Court or to other appointments to the judiciary. De Castro versus JBC. Q69. The signing of the appointing papers and the transmittal of the same was made before the ban, but the acceptance and oath of office happened during the ban. Is the appointment valid? The following elements should always concur in the making of a valid appointment. 1. Authority to appoint and evidence of the exercise of the authority. 2. Transmittal of the appointment paper and evidence of the transmittal. 3. A vacant position at the time of appointment. and 4. Receipt of the appointment paper and acceptance of the appointment by the appointee who possesses all the qualifications and none of the disqualifications. The concurrence of all these elements should always apply, regardless of when the appointment is made whether outside, just before, or during the appointment ban. These steps in the appointment process should always concur and operate as a single process. There is no valid appointment if the process lacks even one step. Thus, all the requisites for a valid appointment must be accomplished before the prohibitory period. Veli Karia Gurafil versus Office of the President Q70. Does the president have disciplinary jurisdiction over deputy ombudsman? No. The ombudsman is an independent constitutional body. By the way, if you're not yet subscribed to our channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and we study together. The constitutional commissions have been consistently intended by the framers to be independent from executive control or supervision or any form of political influence. At least in so far as these bodies are concerned, jurisprudence is not scarce on how the independence granted to these bodies prevents presidential interference. Gonzalez v. OP, 2014, Q71. What is betrayal of public trust? The Constitutional Commission eventually found it reasonably acceptable for the phrase betrayal of public trust to refer to acts which are just short of being criminal but constitute gross faithfulness against public trust, tyrannical abuse of power, inexcusable negligence of duty, favoritism, and gross exercise of discretionary powers. In other words, acts that should constitute betrayal of public trust as to warrant removal from office may be less than criminal, but must be attended by bad faith and of such gravity and seriousness as the other grounds for impeachment. Gonzalez versus Office of the President. Q72. What is the doctrine of qualified political agency? The acts of the secretaries of such departments, performed and promulgated in the regular course of business, are, unless disapproved or reprobated by the chief executive, presumptively the acts of the chief executive. Put simply, when a department secretary makes a decision in the course of performing his or her official duties, the decision 
whether honorable or disgraceful, is presumptively the decision of the president, unless he quickly and clearly disowns it. Vilana versus Secretary of Interior. Q73. What are the military powers of the president? The following are the military powers of the president. Calling out power. The power to suspend writ of habeas corpus. The power to declare martial law. Q74. What are the limitations on the military power of the president? The following are the limitations on the military power of the president. 1. He may call out the armed forces to prevent or suppress lawless violence, invasion, or rebellion only. 2. The grounds for the suspension of the privilege of writ of habeas corpus and the proclamation of martial law are now limited only to invasion or rebellion. 3. The duration of such suspension or proclamation shall not exceed 60 days, following which it shall be automatically lifted. 4. Within 48 hours after such suspension or proclamation, the President shall personally or in writing report his action to the Congress. 5. The Congress may then, by majority vote of all its members voting jointly, revoke his action. The revocation may not set aside by the President. 6. By the same vote and in the same manner, the Congress may, upon initiative of the President, extend his suspension or proclamation for a period to be determined by the Congress. If the invasion or rebellion shall continue and the public safety requires extension, and 7. The action of the President and the Congress shall be subject to review by the Supreme Court, which shall have the authority to determine the sufficiency of the factual basis of such action. This matter is no longer considered a political question and may be raised in an appropriate proceeding by any citizen. Moreover, the Supreme Court must decide the challenge within 30 days from the time it is filed. And 8. Martial law does not automatically suspend the privilege of writ of habeas corpus or the operation of the Constitution. The civil courts and the legislative bodies shall remain open. Military courts and agencies are not conferred jurisdiction over civilians where the civil courts are functioning. 9. The suspension of the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall apply only to persons facing charges of rebellion or offenses inherent in or directly connected with invasion. And 10. Any person arrested for such offenses must be judicially charged the writ within three days, otherwise shall be released. Q75. In a given emergency situation, is it required of the president to follow the sequence of graduated powers? No. The determination of what power to employ in a given situation is solely dependent on the president to decide. Thus, judicial review should not extend to calibrating the president's decision pertaining to which extraordinary power to avail, given a set of facts or conditions. Q76. What are the forms of executive clemency? The following are the forms of executive clemency 1. Reprieves 2. Commutations 3. Pardons 4. Remission of fines 5. For features and 6. Amnesty Q77. What are the limitations on the pardoning power of the president? A. Cannot be exercised in cases of impeachment 2. Reprieves, commutations, and pardons and remission of fines and for features can be given only after conviction by final judgment C. A grant of amnesty must be with the concurrence of a majority of all the members of the Congress. D. No pardon, amnesty, parole, or suspension of sentence for a violation of election laws, rules, and regulations shall be granted by the President without the favorable recommendation of Comelec. E. A pardon cannot be extended to a person convicted of legislative contempt or civil contempt. F. Pardon cannot also be extended for the purpose of absolving the pardonee of civil liability, including judicial costs. G. Pardon will not restore offices forfeited. Q78. Differentiate treaty from executive agreement. As has been observed by U.S. constitutional scholars, a treaty has greater dignity than an executive agreement because its constitutional efficacy is beyond doubt. A treaty having behind it the authority of the president, the Senate, and the people. A ratified treaty, unlike an executive agreement, takes precedence over any prior statutory enactment. U.S. legal scholars opinion that international agreements involving political issues or changes of national policy and those involving international arrangements of a permanent character usually take the form of treaties, while those embodying adjustments of detail carrying out well-established national policies and traditions 
and those involving arrangements of a more or less than prior nature take the form of executive agreement. Bayern Muna v. Romulo 641 Squat 244 Does the Constitution classify what should be the subject matter of a treaty? The Constitution does not classify any subject, like that involving political issues, to be in the form of and ratified as a treaty. What the Constitution merely prescribes is that treaties need the concurrence of the Senate by a vote defined therein to complete the ratification process. Can Congress pass a law increasing the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court? No, because it violates Section 30, Article 6 of the Constitution, which provides that the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court may not be increased by law without its advice or concurrence. Carpio Morales v. CA Can Congress pass a law prohibiting the court from issuing TRO or injunction? No. This will violate the rulemaking power of the Supreme Court under Section 5, Number 5. The issuance of TRO or injunction is a matter of procedure, which is under the exclusive prerogative of the Supreme Court. What are the subject of the rulemaking power of the Supreme Court? 1. The protection and enforcement of constitutional rights. 2. Pleading, practice, and procedure in all courts. 3. The admission to the practice of law. 4. The integrated bar. 5. Legal assistance to the underprivileged.